All right. Um, hopefully you can you can hear me okay. Um, so I'm, I'm pre-recording this. Uh, we got some bad weather here, and so I'm not sure if I can hold up a, a video conference. So I'm just going to record the video and then upload it um, onto YouTube. So. Uh, please email me if you have any questions uh, from what comes up here. I'm going to go ahead and record four and five. Um, so you'll see both of those come up um, soon. So, um, but first thing I um, want to do with this fourth lecture, um, we're going to focus on interest rates. Uh, we've spoken uh, about interest rates in your other finance classes, I'm sure. Um, but uh, we just want to talk a little bit more about the structure uh, of, of interest rates, um, you know, term structure and, and things like that. So uh, let me go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to start off talking about Treasury, LIBOR, the Fed funds rate, and then the, the repo rate or it's a, from repurchase, uh, not repossession. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so those will those will be the rates we're going to start with. So. Uh, treasury rates, these are the ones that we talked about uh, probably in your finance 300 course. Um, you know, we're talking about T-bills uh, and that type of thing. So um, the, the treasury rate is uh, government issues its own debt and its own currency. So, um, you know, for us, it's U.S. dollars. Um, they're quoted in U.S. dollars and the trades are in U.S. dollars. Um, and so that's, that's the treasury rate. Um, uh, LIBOR... Uh, is this interbank uh, lending rate, um, you know? And so um, this used to be our, our standard. Um, if you notice the third bullet point, um, you know, we talked about um, LIBOR being manipulated, you know, um, and we're not here to have a discussion, unfortunately, I'm, I'm pre-recording it. So just, just so you understand, um, the, these LIBOR rates serve as the basis for a lot of adjustable rates. Um, and so you would be incentivized at certain times to let the rate go a bit higher, um, and then at other times let it go a bit lower. So there's a lot more volatility. It wasn't that it was systemically biased necessarily one way or the other, but because they can manipulate timing, um, it would, you were able to, to take advantage of certain, um, you know, repurchase agreements or, or re, uh, refinancing uh, terms, things like that. So uh, it requ would require collusion between banks, though, because this is a, a market interbank loan. Uh, so in theory, they're going to other banks to, to set this loan. Uh, and that did happen, uh, unfortunately. But, um, but that LIBOR rate does still exist. Um, the, the U.S. Fed funds rate, um, this is, um, we, we see this in the United States. Uh, so I'm going to speak uh, about that more, although other countries uh, can do this as well. Um, so if you imagine like two banks, Bank A and Bank B, and they each have reserves being held at the Federal Reserve, right? And this is the basis uh, upon which they'll make their loans. Um, so if you think about, uh, they have so much uh, in reserve and then that gives them the, the ability to make an additional, you know, X dollars in, in loans, you know, maybe 10 times or, or six times as much, depending on what the reserve uh, uh, requirement is. So they, um, they, they'll have that amount of money there. However, the amount of loans they have outstanding can fluctuate wildly, right? And they can also, uh, and, and you'll see this, like their timing uh, of payroll, <laughs> you know, can, can affect a lot of these types of things just because of the way um, money, money will transfer. Uh, and so your balances will go up and down or your required balances will go up and down a lot faster than the, the physical balance at the reserve will. Uh, and so what you can have is then maybe bank A will tell bank B, hey, I have excess reserves. I don't need this. You know, I can loan you the money that's already there. Um, and then you agree to pay, give me something in the future. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll come up with this agreement between the two um, and they'll, they'll just get, you know, um, but by doing that, they're setting a rate. It's not like they're they're calling up necessarily everybody and say, hey, you know, but they 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 get into these uh, transactions where some people they need money, some have the excess, uh, and they come up. And th this rate tends to be you know much lower than you would normally think of a of a bank uh, loan. But they're not loaning to individuals. This is 
a bank loaning to another bank and it's fully collateralized at the Federal Reserve. So this is, you know, you know, literally the among the safest um, types of transactions. Um, and then the last would be uh, this repo rate. Um, and uh, what, what this is, is like you, you can say um, here, I'm going to give you these uh, US treasuries, for instance, right? Uh, I've got, a, you know, millions of dollars of those. Uh, so I'm going to sell them to you today for this low price. And I agree, I'm going to buy them back tomorrow or some, some point in the future. Uh, but it could be like tomorrow at this higher price. And that higher price is, is generally going to be the market price, right? So you're going you're gonna to sell it at a discount now and agree to buy it back in the future for what the price should be. And the reason that it is so safe, uh, you know, for the person taking the other side is if you were to not buy it back, they could sell it to anybody else in the market, right? Because they could just sell it at that market rate. They already made their money because they bought it from you at a discount, right? So um, that's, that's how that repo rate, you know, comes about. So uh, the repo, like I said, is a repurchase agreement. Um, not, not repossession or, or anything like that. It's not negative at, at all. So um, we're, we're going to talk about building these types of swaps uh, in, in a few lectures from now, but just wanted to say the most commonly we're going to talk about LIBOR as our floating rate, and then we're going to exchange that for a fixed rate. Um, if you look at other things like the, um, the, the repurchase agreements and stuff, those tend to be short lived. The, uh, the Fed, um, Fed funds rate, that's, that's very particular types of institutions uh, that are both within a particular reserve, you know, regime. So, you know, th those are very particular types of agreements. So normally LIBOR, this is that interbank rate, you know, and it can serve as a basic rate um, for us to, uh, like adjustable rate mortgages can be LIBOR plus some percentage, right? So, um, so normally when we're building swaps, it's, it's to go from LIBOR to some sort of fixed rate. Um, and so uh, we will um, build some of these swaps uh, here in a, in, a, um, in a week or so. Uh, yeah. um, and then what that leads to then is this OIS, right? The overnight index swap, right? And um, so what this is, is, is an average, you know, of the, the overnight rates, right? And up to... Uh, a year, um, we're going to quote this as what we call a zero rate, and we'll get into zero rates in a, in a few slides, but uh, just understand it, it's, it's treated one way uh, up to a year, and then there's sort of a break, uh, and then after that, uh, we go from um, like continuous up to like this quarterly, um, and you start having to worry about um, income streams like um, interest payments being paid, like things like coupon rates of bonds, right? So if it's beyond a year, you're going to have some sort of in, uh, intermediate cash flow that we got to take care of. So that's why we sort of have this break in the OIS um, rate. Okay. Um, the risk-free rate, you know, we we talk about risk-free in like finance 300 and 301 and, and 324 and and everything, and, and we just sort of talk about treasuries and, and using that as that risk-free. Um, just, just understand that uh, the U.S. Treasury rate is artificially low. Right? There, there are certain organizations that have to buy treasuries, right? Like the U.S. Um, uh, Social Security, right? They, they have to buy special U.S. Treasuries uh, to invest their, um, the taxes that they get paid to them. Um, and so because you have that, right, um, and um, if you have treasury instruments, um, then that frees up a lot of other capital like cash that you could use for other purposes because you can use like repo agreements and things like that. So, um, so they, they get a lot of advantages. So a lot of people will own them, right? And if you have increased demand for that limited supply, right, um, the price goes up. And so in this case, what that means is the interest rate goes down, right? So the government ends up paying less and less on debt, 
which uh, American taxpayers love. Right, they're they're very happy to uh, to have artificially low borrowing rates because it means lower taxes. So, um, but yeah, so um, for our purposes here, we're going to use OIS rates as the risk free, just because that that's a, a more representative um, risk free cost. So, um, okay, and then uh, I think we've. Um, probably have covered this in another one of your classes, you know, about interest rates. Um, and so we're going to talk about, you know, annual compounding, quarterly compounding, things like that. In this course, we're going to use continuous compounding, and that's just so we can use um, exponential functions. Uh, and so we, you, can, you can calculate between those. Um, and so this is to, to show you uh, you know, if you were to have this particular uh, investment of $100 and it grows at 10%, um, the more frequently you compound it, you notice those numbers are going higher and higher. Um, but you see it's, it's increasing, but it's increasing at a decreasing rate, right? And it's eventually going to reach some maximum um, frequency, and that frequency is the continuous, right? When, when M approaches infinity, right? As, um, so... Uh, but the math ends up being a lot nicer in a lot of ways. So, so we're going to go with uh, continuous compounding. So, um, so yeah, so this, this just uh, is the, the bit that I just said. So it, it, we're going to use E to some uh, power. Um, R is the compound rate. And then T is the amount of time. So, um, so yeah. And so th these are the formulas that you would use uh, if you have some sort of like annual rated or quarterly rate, um, then you would use that top function R sub C to get the compound, a continuous compound rate. Uh, if you have the continuous compound, but you need to convert that to like a monthly rate or a quarterly rate or annual rate, uh, then you would use that R sub M equals, right? And that would, uh, the M that you use there depends on, you know, one for annual, four for quarterly, 12 for monthly. Um, so you could, uh, convert that. Uh, daily and continuous are, are really close because because uh, you've gone all the way to, you know, 300 uh, or 365. So um, that, that's going to be pretty close to your um, continuous rate. But um, but yeah, but anytime we're, we're talking in here, we'll, we'll be talking about continuous rates. Um, and so this is to show if you had 10% uh, of semi-annual, then that ends up being, you know, this 9.758 with continuous. Um, if it was eight continuous, it would eight eight point oh eight quarterly. So it just shows you like the um, the the numbers will look a little smaller with continuous, but it, it'll convert directly to some other compounding rate. So we we tend to not think in continuous terms, uh, so we don't quote it that way. You go to the bank, you want to hear a nice annual rate, and it, you want it to be a nice round number like ten percent, uh, you know that kind of thing. But um, but just understand these are these are interchangeable. Um, you, you can convert from one to the other. Um, okay. Um, and so we'll, we'll also discuss in this class something called zero rates. Um, and a, a zero rate, uh, you can kind of think of this like zero coupon bonds, right? And when you, when you looked at bonds, you studied like, well, some bonds don't pay a coupon, right? Uh, well, they, they pay a coupon of zero, so we would call them zero coupon bonds. Uh, and zero rate is saying, okay, well, we're only going to get paid at maturity. We're not getting paid anywhere in between, right? And so you can think of it, uh, at least that's how I keep it straight when, when I think about it. So I'm going to do an example, but uh, this is to show like uh, if you went to the market and you saw uh, all these different time periods, uh, you know, in six months, the zero rate uh, continuous compounding is 5%. At one year, it'd be 5.8, 1.5 is one, one and a half years, 18 months would be 6.4%, uh, uh, and in two years, 6.8. So um, if we were going to calculate the value of a bond, let's say it's paying, um, you know, this, um, this is two years, right? And so you see all these rates, um, you know, the, the, um, 5%, 5.8%, 6.4%, right? Just convert that to a decimal form. Um, it, they say it's a 6% coupon, right? So if it's a $100 uh, bond, then you're getting three coupon payments of $3 each plus the $100 par value at the end. Um, 
it's, I, we tend to write it this way um, because we'll, we're saying it's a hundred percent of par, which is why you'll see, you know, the, the hundred show up and then we just multiply the six times a hundred to get six. And then that's three semi-annually. Um, the, the reason we do that is, you know, with, with corporate bonds, they're always going to be quoted, you know, in, in thousand, but, but munis are in 5,000 treasuries will be like a hundred thousand. So uh, because we're dealing in worlds that, you know, maybe we're using treasuries an awful lot because those are high denomination. They're very uh, liquid. So it's easy for us to use them. They're part of those repurchase agreements all the time. So um, it's easier just to talk about it in terms of percent of par. Uh, and so that's why you'll, you'll see this written out in case you're wondering like, hey, why isn't like a thousand for a bond? Because this could be treasuries that are a hundred thousand or, or something like that. We just think of it in terms of percentage of par. Um, so um, this is, um, to calculate a, a bond yield. So, you know, we have um, what the bond value is. Well, what would that yield be equivalent to? Um, then you would just solve for what, what is the interest rate uh, that, would, that would get us to that particular value, um, you know, just equal to the, the market price of the bond. So it's, it's the way you calculated uh, bond yields um, in Finance 324, uh, if you did that, it's just now we're going to uh, allow for this continuous compounding. Uh, so before it was normally like semi-annual compounding, um, but but now we're just going to do this. Uh, the the formula is going to look a little different because we have this exponential term e to some power. Um, but but don't um, don't let that confuse you too much. It's the same type of, of calculation you did uh, in earlier finance classes. Um, now the, the par yield is different than the zero yield because the par yield, um, we're going to have that, that periodic cash flow. So you're going to, when we talk about the OIS, uh, that swap rate, uh, we're going to talk about this break that occurs, uh, between, um, the, um, zero yield up to one year and then and go into the par yield, but just, um, to, to give you where, where this is um, coming from, right? And so, um, so this is to, again, uh, give you that, that particular uh, yield. So uh, here's an example. So we're gonna use um, these particular rates. You see here we have uh, in three months, in six months, in a year, in a year and a half, and then in two years, and everything that's one year or less, there's no coupon, right? Um, and then the coupon, you know, there is for a year and a half and a two years because, um, you know, we, we, we had that break, right? Um, and so this is what the, the bond prices currently are um, for those different bonds, right? Okay. Um, and so using this data, what we're going to do is what's, what's called bootstrapping. And so uh, if you studied uh, computer programming, uh, you may have heard of, of bootstrap programs. Uh, and that's where the program knows just enough to open up the next bit of the program. And then by reading that, then it opens up the next bit of the program. And so it teaches itself how to understand itself, right? right. And so uh, that's why computers will boot up, right? Because that's what it's doing is it's writing enough code to understand itself. And then it, you know, teaches itself to read and then it grabs a book and reads it kind of, kind of thing. So we're doing the, the same type of thing here. Um, you know, bootstrap kind of comes from that pull yourself up by your bootstrap. So if you're stuck in mud, you could grab the, the straps of your boot and pull it up enough that you could kind of get some mud under your boot to push up against, and then you do it to your other boot and sort of work your way out of a mud hole. Uh, so that's kind of where this bootstrap uh, comes from. So we're going to use what information we have um, to fill in uh, these other rates, right? So we don't know what the one and a half year rate would be if this were zero coupon, right? But we know what the bond price is, we know what the coupon is, and we know how much time we have, right? And so that, that's what we're looking at here, right? So we have the 96, right, for the price, it's 100% par, and then we're gonna have, um, you know, this coupon of $4, right? Because it's eight, right? But it's it pay semi-annually, right? So it's going to pay this in six months, this in a year, and this in a year and a half, because this is the year and a half rate, right? And then solving for R, uh, you know, we would get 
what that uh, one and a half year rate would be. And then we get what the two year rate would be, right? And so this, this is what that curve would end up looking like, right? This is the six month rate um you know initially and then we were able to fill in what the one and a half was given what one one and a half was with coupons and then taking out these other pieces and then same thing for the two-year rate and then you can see the yield curve kind of like what you're used to seeing this upward sloping right so as you go further into the future you expect interest rates um you know to be a bit higher um you know with the, the shortest term being the lowest rates so that's just uh, to give you an example. Um, or I think I already said this, but the OIS rates, uh, we quoted out to a year zero rates. And then beyond that, there's the par yield. Um, again, because you have the intermediate cash flows. Um, the OIS, remember, this is a, an average, um, you know, about these swap rates and things like that. And so we don't know exactly what these underlying coupons and, you know, there's just, it'd be a lot to try to, to separate out because it is this average rate. So they just go ahead and leave it as par yields with everything that's more than a year out. And then um, we go from there. So, um, and so the, the forward rate uh, is what the future zero rate is that's implied uh, under the, the market. So if I tell you, okay, right now, you can get a one year bond that pays this much or you can get a six month bond that pays this much and you'll have to reinvest it six months from now, right? And so if we know that, then I can say, well, assuming the market's efficient, this taking the money now and investing it for six months and then reinvesting it at whatever rate that is available then must be equal to this one year investment. Because if it were not, everybody would buy the one year and not buy the six month until the, the, the price is balanced, right? Or if it was too good to do the six months at a time, then everybody would want to buy it. They would leave the other one. And then the, again, the prices would correct, right? Um, and so we're at, the forward rate is saying, okay, well, in six months, I think that the, the, the future rate is going to be this. Right, so so hopefully uh, you, you'll, you'll see sort of this relationship between forwards and futures uh, within within interest rates. Because um, the next thing we're going to go into is how to price forwards and futures, and so um, that, that's why this part uh, matters. So um, <clears throat> uh, the formula we're going to use, like I was saying, like you know, uh, one year and a half of a year, you know, but it, it could be any uh, time periods. Um, and then we have our different interest rates. And so it'll be the, the second interest rate times whatever that's the length of that second time period is minus the short-term interest rate times the short-term time period, right? And this is gonna give us, you know, the difference in the rate times the time, right? So what, what that total would be. Um, and then we're gonna divide that by the difference in the time periods, right? So, um, all right, um, let me see. Uh, but this has to be continuous. It says it's only approximately true. Um, yes, uh, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where when it's when you're continuously compound it, um, you know, this, this converges to being true, right? But when you uh, are using something less, um, then it's not exactly this, but oftentimes it's gonna be pretty close. Uh, it, the more frequently you're compounding you know, the, the more accurate it is, but we're gonna use continuous compounding. So we don't have to, to worry about that. So here's to show you again, here's some zero rates, right? Um, and then here's what the forward rate is. And then we're gonna, we're gonna calculate, um, oh no, I guess we're not, okay. Um, oh, oh, so it's say like if you, okay, I'm sorry. I, um, so this is just, you know, what would the rate need to be to equal this with the compounding, right? And so, um, I, I, I messed up there, but um, this is to, to show you based on the, the yield curve. So if it's got the upward sloping, the, this is our, um, our normal yield curve, you know, forward rates will be higher than the zero rate, which is higher than par yield. If we have an inverted yield curve where it's downward sloping, then the car, par yield is the largest and the forward rates are the smallest, right? So the, the what that yield curve is giving you this um, 
expectation as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over the forward rate agreements just because um, we're, we're going to talk about that more when we get into um, lecture seven. Um, so I'm going to skip over this part um, and, and just finish up with this uh, discussion on term structure. Um, so that you can may say, well, look, we know these things don't always hold exactly, right? In the real world, you know, things um, don't, don't always fit. And so finance professors, you know, we have to sit around and think about, well, why is that the case, right? Um, and so there's, there's three ways we, we sort of think about um, what could lead to the term structure being the way it is. Uh, and during different time periods, different ones seems to be more true, right? It might be general perceptions of risk may change in the market, right? Before the financial crisis, after the financial crisis, you know, before um, the um, dot-com bubble and then after the dot-com bubble, right? I mean, there's those different perceptions, right? But, um, but if you think of expectations theory, this is what a lot of the math that we're doing now is based on, um, you know, that, that we just have this expectation in the market, right? And that's what is causing the yield curve to, to smooth out the way that it does, right? It, um, a different view, like one reason why we can see this junctions is this market segmentation, right? Where short-term rates are completely separate from long-term rates. And that could be because it's a completely different market. So think of it like, um, if I need a 10 year bond, I need a 10 year bond. And even though two year bonds may be looking beautiful right now, I cannot look at my you know, 10 year liability and say, yes, and I'm gonna use this two year asset to offset it, right? Because I don't know where the market will be in two years and I may end up hurting myself, right? And so that's what the, the market segmentation says, look, if you're in the market for a 10 year bond, you're in the market for a 10 year bond. Right, um, and then um, another piece on this one, it's, it's, it's not on this slide, but it's, it's another thing called preferred habitat. And that's where you say, well, yeah, I mean, I need a 10 year bond, but if that five year bond looks really good, I'll probably just take the risk, um, you know, with the understanding that I can rebalance sometime in between, um, you know, so I prefer to keep it as close as possible, but I'm willing to, to get out a little bit. And that's why it's the preferred habitat, you know, um, you know, the deer prefer to live in this area, but if homes keep being built and the deer may just move, you know, even though it's not their preferred habitat. So, um, and then, but then the last thing is liquidity preference. Just generally we expect to, uh, to want to be able to, to get cash as quickly as possible, right? So we, there's this preference for us to be um, as liquid um, as possible. So, um, but yeah, so, um, this, this is just some things to, to read over and think about this liquidity preference, you know, and, um, and that type of thing. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and end the recording.